Good evening, and welcome to our study tonight. Tonight, I want to give you just a few announcements if I'm able. Uh, next week, I'll be starting an in-depth study on the book of Genesis, which will lay down many of the biblical truths about dozens of beliefs that you and I have versus secular thought. And it'll give you a basis of defending your faith, kind of like an apologetics, in hundreds of subjects, many that modern science and education just balk at, and many, many, many more. Let me give you just a little preview of what that'll look like. If you can see this chart, Genesis gives us the foundation of the doctrines of sin and the fall, redemption and justification, the promise of Messiah and Jesus Christ way back in Genesis, the personality and the, and the uh, personhood of God, the kingdom of God, and then Genesis shows us the origin of the universe, the order and complexity, the solar system, the atmosphere and hydrosphere, life, man, marriage, good and evil, language, government, culture, nations, religion. We'll talk about evolution and how what a big lie that's, that has been and how it's been forced down everybody's throat. We'll talk about a, a whole lot of things from also a science point of view and disproving it. So you don't want to miss that. <clears throat> I tell you this at the start of In the News because a great many thousands of you, and there are thousands, tune into In the News on YouTube and other, other media, social media. But some may not stay for the study. A lot of you do, but some may not stay uh, th for the study that follows. If that's you, you are missing the greatest part of this ministry. I get hundreds, if not thousands of letters uh, like this one, and I don't ever do this, but this is a letter that was sent to me last week. I'm not going to read all of it for you. I just want to read a little bit just to understand. These letters just bless me, and I'll tell you why in a moment. He says, Dear Pastor Carell, I just wanted to thank you for doing what you do. A couple of years back, I was very lost in sin and depression, not knowing the Lord. My girlfriend at that time, Ashley, we've since become married, uh, started getting saved and introduced me to your In the News, something about you really grabbed my attention. It was finding you on your and your teaching that really helped open my eyes to Christ and the Lord. I started getting into the Bible. Um, I decided to go, and I'm skipping, I decided to go to church. Never did I expect what had happened in these two years in my life, but I've never been happier. In these years, her and I really uh, pressed into the Lord, turned from sin, started serving a church, and took classes necessary to be pastors and do any kind of serving. We got baptized. Uh, as our youth pastor asked if I wanted to help with our youth, uh, our youth group. It terrified me, but I said, God, if this is where you need me, okay. I've been helping six to seven months faithfully. He goes on and says, God willing, we might try to go on a missions trip to Costa Rica with our church this year. All glory to God in my story, but I really wanted to thank you for being amazing and Ashley uh, introducing me to your videos. I may never have... I may, ne I may have never gotten right if I didn't see your videos. Your story is such an inspiration to me. I pray for you and yours every day. When you were going through the hard times recently with cancer, I put you on, on my church's prayer list every week. Before I knew any of the pastors, when I met the man, main one, uh, Devin, for the first time and introduced myself, he said, oh, you always put a pastor on your prayer card. He asked me how I knew you. I explained I didn't, but you were awesome and, and, and a true man of the Lord. If we were closer, we would love to see you preach in public and just meet you. Shake your hand and say thanks for your blessings, boldness in Christ. Your John study inspired me to write a John rap. And by the way, he wrote the rap to me. It's pretty amazing. If we never meet on earth, I know one day we'll meet up in the sky so I can give you a handshake and a big hug. God bless you always. You and yours, and again, thank you for helping me on journey with Christ. Start. God bless Cyril Harding and Ashley Harding. Man, it's many letters like these that truly humble me. And I want to thank you, Cyril and Ashley, and all of you who write and support this ministry, not only with money, but with kind words like this. That is more payment to me than anything that could possibly happen, to see a life change. What is, what is better than that? So I'm... I don't know if Ashley and Cheryl are listening tonight, but thank you for that letter. Pretty powerful. And yes, one day I do want to see you. Uh, I do go to Pennsylvania every now and then, and uh, I'll try to look you up. So yes, In the News is wonderful to keep us up to date in prophecy in our world. But keep listening, and I promise you, your life will be blessed by the Word of God. Your faith increased by, by the in-depth teaching of the Word of God. And again, thank you tonight for being with us. Let's go right into In the News and tell you what's going on. 
And if I can get right over here, we'll try to take you there. So let's talk about this. This is un, unreported stories of 2023. So by now you know, and you should know, that American media, and I'm talking about all of American media, is extremely biased, one side or another. And it's propaganda and sensationalism. All they want to do is get you to listen to it. Um, and today, I want to give you just a little bit of this report that says some of the things that weren't covered that actually happened. Let's talk about the Nashville Shooters Manifesto. You remember the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department has continued to withhold uh, Hale's manifesto nine months after the shooting. And the legacy medium largely ignored leaked pages of Haley's diary posted on social media by talk show host Stephen Crowder on November 6th. When news leaks uh, thwart conservative aims, they're news. When, leak, when leaks harm liberal causes, they're, they're protected and they're not mentioned at all. Let's talk about this one. Studies show the dangers of transgender surgeries and the LGBTQ lifestyle. Bet you didn't hear that on any, on any news outlet. Several studies this past year have, have revealed the dangers of the LGBT lifestyle. Uh, one of the most dramatic is the chair of a transgender surgery department found that people who have transgender surgeries are much, much lonelier and much more depressed than those who do nothing. Ha quoting, higher loneliness levels were significantly associated with already having a gendered reassignment surgery. A different study found a majority, 56% of women who had vaginoplasty experienced pain for years after the procedure, and one in three had difficulty urinating and having any sexual relations. The data comes from a study of patients who underwent bottom surgery, it's called, from the post-operative care clinic at the Women's College Hospital in Ontario between 2018 and 2020. The media never reported anything like this. Female students, LGBTQ plus students, and students who had any same-sex partners were more likely than their peers to experience poor mental health and suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Now watch this, said a Biden administration report released in February by the CDC. Did you hear it on the news? Absolutely not. Three times as likely, it said, to have seriously considered attempting suicide or made a suicide plan and a 366.6% more likely to have attempted suicide, but it was never reported in the media. And here's another one, open border transforms America. You hear a lot about the border, but nothing like this. Joe Biden has set a number of records, obviously. Unfortunately, they're all for new national humiliations. Among his worst failure is, of course, the open, the open U.S. border with Mexico. Uh, a reported 10 million illegal entries have taken place since Biden took office. And they have radically and deliberately transformed the nation we live in against the will of the American people. No one knows where the plane loads of illegal immigrants Biden flies around from the country are going. We hear about the governor of Texas and we hear about him sending, sending people to Martha's Vineyard, but you never hear about all the planes, hundreds of them, that the Biden administration loads up with illegals and sends to all kinds of communities. No one ever hears that because the, the media won't report it. Here's another one. The LGBT agenda is losing support, thank God, and it's not being reported. Although the legacy media gives the LGBTQ political agenda un uniformly positive coverage and focuses on group far out of proportion to the demo demographic share of the population, this year they omitted several salient stories. Multiple, multiple polls found that the LGBTQ cause has lost political support in 2023, even among its most supportive generation. Among Americans born in 1997, known as Generation Z, support for the same-sex marriage fell by a whopping 14 percent percentage points since 2021. Percentage of Americans who believe same-sex relationships are morally acceptable fell by 9 percent this year. Most Americans do not see a married gay or lesbian couple raising children together either as completely acceptable. 47 percent do not. And even fewer believe an unmarried same-sex couple should raise a child. Even the Biden administration's U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration admitted people who identify as gay or lesbian or bisexual are far more likely to suffer from major depression, abuse illegal drugs, and are up to six times as likely to attempt suicide. Transgender ideology 
also lost support, with 55% majority of Americans saying changing one's gender is morally wrong. Have you heard it on the news? Of course not. Joseph Goebbels would have been real proud of our news in America, that propagandist from Hitler's regime. Another one that they never reported on is churchgoers and married people are the happiest people in America. Despite an endless barrage of negative media about the drudgeries of married life and the pointlessness of faith, multiple studies this year verified the benefits of both Americans who believe in God and value marriage as more likely to be very, very happy. They're also far more likely to vote Republican. Uh, the AI, AEI study is called, also found that overall, I'm quoting, religious Americans tend to believe their life is meaningful more often than do those who are not religious. Evangelical Christians are 38% more likely than unbelievers to say their actions matter in the grand scope of things. Even the Biden administration issued a warning this year saying Americans' health may be undermined by not attending church. You don't hear that from anyone. A report from the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, which was released in May, says loneliness harms physical health, quote, even greater than the risk associated with obesity and physical inactivity. And it's bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Did the media report that? Nope. Religious or faith-based groups can be a source of regular social contact. This is from the Biden administration's uh, the uh, uh, Surgeon General. Serve as a community for support, provide meaning and purpose, create a sense of belonging, and share values and beliefs, and are associated with reduced risk-taking behaviors, Murthy writes. As a consequence, he says, of this decline in participation, individuals' health may be undermined in America. And then this one was never reported either. Huge increase in homeschooling and at stay-at-home moms. Not reported in social media or network news outlets. According to the Washington Post, homeschooling has become the fastest growing form of education, I'm quoting, in the United States. A 56% increase in homeschooling in the last five years. With school strikes, lower education standards, the teachers hiding children's transgenderism and teaching woke curricula, repeating the lies of the 1619 Project and stock, stocking school libraries with gay pornographic books, it's easy to see why. At the same time, the number of stay-at-home moms has increased. Stay-at-home moms skyrocketed from 15% in 2022 to a whopping 25% in 2023. The children raised by mothers who care enough to sacrifice their career advancement for their child's development and education may just offset the kids neglected by the public school system since the COVID-19 pandemic. They will be our nation's greatest hope and the source of our nation's good news stories for years to come. So let's go on a little bit further. This happened this week. That's Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. He had a mysterious disappearance, I'm sure you know by now. Uh, it means he needs to go. He needs to be impeached and he needs to go. In the New Year's strangest bureaucratic mystery and one of the strangest in any year, Lloyd Austin, who is 70, was hospitalized on January 1st. But nobody in the White House, not even President Joe Biden, knew that fact until January 5th. The Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks, who would stand in for him in an emergency, didn't know until January 3rd. And even then, she didn't even know he was in the hospital. This is no minor lapse. The U.S. military forces are on high alert in the Middle East and two aircraft carriers were moved into the Mediterranean as a deterrent to Iranian intervention in the Israeli-Hamas war. And those carriers and other vessels have come under fire. If Biden wanted any of these forces to take offensive action, if he wanted to push the button for them and tell them, give them a green light, um, if he wanted to do that, the orders to the regional combatant commander would go through the Secretary of Defense. If Biden or his National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, called a principal's meeting, Austin would represent the Defense Department. Are you kidding me? National Defense Secretary is AWOL for four days? Isn't Biden communicating with him on a daily basis? Should he not be communicating with him? We have, we have wars all over this planet and this Secretary of Defense is nowhere to be found and the White House doesn't know where he is? What kind of a lame, what kind of a lame uh, administration is this? I mean, how in the world could this? Biden's not just hiding in his basement. He's hiding in plain view. It's worse than paying $400 to attend an Eagles football game and the team doesn't show up and no one knows why four times in a row. I mean, this is ridiculous. I can't believe. And now, Congress is calling for his resignation. If Austin were a vital member of Biden's national security time, 
team, if he were deeply enmeshed in the decision making on the wars in the Ukraine and the Middle East, excuses might be made and tolerated. But the fact that Biden learned of Austin's absence after four days, the fact that Biden hadn't been in touch with his Secretary of Defense for four days during a period of round the clock military operations and crises, suggests that Austin is far from essential, isn't he? This is all the more significant, as Biden nominated Austin in a large part because the two had close relationship. You see, Biden's beloved son, Bo, served on Austin's staff in Iraq, and he went to church with him every Sunday. It was a favor to put Austin there, but he hasn't made any dents in the Pentagon's way of doing business, has he? At a time when innovation and efficiency are more vital than ever. As his unnoticed four-day MIA stint suggests, he hasn't stepped up or, or as a constant top-level advisor to the president, as most defense secretaries would at a time like this. We've learned just, I think it was today or yesterday, that he was there for prostate cancer surgery. Well, we, we hope in the best to get well, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about going AWOL. And get this, Austin was just the third retired general ever to be nominated for Secretary of Defense less than seven years after leaving the armed forces. Because the law forbids such people to become defense secretaries unless Congress issues a waiver. At his confirming confirmation hearing, Austin pledged to rely heavily on the Pentagon's civilian leaders and he got a waiver. Here's another article on it. What we know about Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's hospitalization. He had been in the hospital since New Year's Day and it shocked the Pentagon, can you believe that? And the press corps and the National Security Establishment. Um, many questions, including what was wrong with him and when will he, when he'll leave Walter Reed National Military Center in Maryland, which I think he's still there right now. I may be wrong on that, but I think he is. So on January 1st, he began experiencing severe pain and was transported to his home, from his home to Walter Reed by an ambulance, where he was admitted into intensive care. Right then, somebody should have alerted, alerted the Pentagon. Right then. But nobody decided that they wanted to do that. So for days, other Pentagon, Pentagon officials and senior members of the Biden administration, including President Biden, had absolutely no idea where the defense secretary was or if he was in the hospital. Which makes me really upset is that no one asked. No one said, did you see the defense secretary? Can you imagine? This is a, this is a cabinet member. No notification was made to Hicks, his next in command, or the National Security Council, or the military service secretaries until days later. The Pentagon is reviewing, it says, its notification processes and procedures. You think, because they haven't been there before? There's no, there's no system for this? When a, in the bureaucratic red tape, you don't have a system of, of review of when somebody's out who takes over for them? I find that really hard to believe in the most advanced country in the, in the, in the world. But Biden says, this article says, is standing by Lloyd Austin. So despite the mounting questions about why Austin and his staff failed to notify the White House, Congress, and the National Security Council, officials have insisted that Biden is standing by Austin. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said on Monday that there are, quote, no plans or anything other than for Secretary Austin to stay in the job, continue in the leadership that he's been demonstrating. What leadership? That's not leadership. Lawmakers are demanding accountability and more answers. Republican Representative Matt Rosendale of Montana, who is eyeing a bid for the Senate, say he is planning to induce impeachment articles for Austin this past Tuesday. Republican Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa told reporters, it's absolutely unacceptable when we've got Houthis attacking Americans and carrier ships, when we have the Israeli Gaza war going on, what we have in Ukraine going on, and we have a Secretary of Defense that is just absent. Senator Joe Manchin said that Austin's actions were very disturbing and that he supports some sort of hearing, public or private, to examine what, hap what happens. He said Congress needs answers. Of course we need answers. This is, a, a, this is a dysfunctional administration from the top down. It's dysfunctional. And Mayorkas is also coming up on impeachment charges. So we're watching this cabinet start to, get, start to disappear, really. Uh, not just not just calling in and sick, but disappearing literally. They may find themselves all with a pink slip. And I hope so, because we need more than that. We, we, we can do better than that, obviously, especially in a time like this. Let's go to Israel and tell you a little bit about that. This is some good news. 
Israel's population tops 9.8 million in 2023 as its, as its Christian population also grows. So you would think that people would, would not want to go to a war-torn area, but people are flocking, Jews are flocking to Israel in mass in 2023, and it's continuing, by the way, even after the Hamas, the Hamas horrific time in October 6th and 7th. And so today they're going there. Israel's population rose as 2024 began, hitting 9.842 million, according to the Central Bureau of Statistics. It's estimated that its current growth rate, Israel's population will pass 10 million in 2024, and it's prophetic. This is what they call Aliyah. Jesus, God said that he would, he would bring them back from the four corners of the earth, and that's exactly what's happening today. Uh, there are roughly 9,842,000 Israelis living in the country at the end of 2023. 7,028,000 are Jews, representing 73.2% of the population. The Christian population of Israel is also growing, with approximately 187,900 living in Israel at the end of 2023. And most of them are Messianic Jews. It's Jews being converted to Christianity, almost 2% of the population so far. So 75.3% of Christians in Israel are ethnic Arabs. And Arabs make up 7% of the total Arab populations. They're forgotten many times, but Arab Christians are very, very prominent in Israel. Similarly, since Hamas took over in Gaza, the Christian population in Gaza has declined from 5,000 Christians to 1,100 today. They're fleeing. Palestinian Christians have generally chosen to immigrate to Argentina, Chile, Australia, Canada, and the United States. So again, we're watching prophecy happen. Let's talk a little bit about, about this war. Why this war is different from other wars. Hamas's brutal massacre of 1,200 innocent women ch and children and men, young and old, sick and well, proves that this is not a war like any other war. It's not a war between two civilized belligerents who roughly agree on a set of values regarding human life. Such extraordinary behavior requires that each soldier recognize the, com the common humanity of the other, anchored in the mutual belief that the other cherishes and values human life and other shared values. The fanatics of Hamas do not butcher women and children in the hopes of creating a Palestinian state. That's a ruse. They do not behead children to secure their purported rights to national self-determination. They do not hide among the civilians of Gaza, wearing no uniforms and observing no laws of war. It's not like any other war. In order to promote the cause of human rights, they don't care about human rights. Instead, they act according to a fantastic fascist worldview built atop a blend of radical Islam and Jew hatred. Hamas's founding covenants make it clear, I've told it to you before, as do the writings of the founders of the larger Muslim Brotherhood movement that gave rise to Hamas and other groups like it. Indeed, Hamas's charter includes a quote, a quote from Hassan al-Banna, and it says, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, which reads, quote, Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it. It's just as it obliterated others before it. But Hamas does not want a total war against Israel, but a total extermination of all Jews. Hamas's charter proves this by making no distinction between Israel, Zionists, and Jews. It states elsewhere, quote, Israel, Judaism, and Jews challenge Islam and the Muslim people. May the cowards never sleep. May we kill them all. The promise and the purpose of the state of Israel is that Jews will never again be left scattered and helpless. Never again will Jews be subjected to butchery. Collected into a nation state, nation state, the Jewish people live and possess the inalienable right to defend themselves in the face of evil and aggression. This is the truth philosopher Hannah Arendt recognized in a reporting on the trial of Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann in 1948. Her message to Eichmann applies to every Hamas member today. Let me quote it. To Eichmann, she said, just as you supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the Jewish people, we find that no one, no member of the human race can be expected to want to share the earth with you. This is the reason and the only reason you must hang. And hang he did. Let me go a little bit further and talk about some prophetic foreshocks. Hamas attacks stirring Jewish re faith revival in Messiah. I just told you that the Christians in Israel are growing and uh, Jews are becoming saved. This is this article that came out this week. Likud member of the Knesset, Galit Distel 
at the Baryan addressed the plenum on Wednesday. And despite self-identifying as non-religious, her address praised the messianic manifestations appearing among the idea of the, the uh, soldiers in Gaza. Distel Atbarian described the gathering of hundreds of soldiers singing Ani Mamin, which is, I believe, before going into combat in Gaza. The song's words are, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, and though he tarry, I will wait daily for his coming. I get chills just reading that. It's a declaration of a belief that Messiah is going to come in their lifetime. She said, yesterday I saw one of the most shocking films, no, one of the most touching films I have seen that came out of this war until now. Hundreds of soldiers in one hall, she said, singing that they believe with complete faith in the coming of Messiah. It's a little strange because as emotional as this is, every newspaper in Israel you open, every television show you watch, every article in Haaretz newspaper defines this belief in the Messiah, this burning and eternal belief of the nation of Israel, this messianic belief, as the greatest existential danger to our country right now because Israel is very secular. Because unfortunately, Israeli media is left-leaning and just as secular as ours is. Why is this so ridiculous and ridiculed as being dangerous, she asks. Distel then quoted the book of Isaiah. This is a non-believer. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into puning hooks. Nations shall not rise up against nation. They shall never again know war. Isaiah 2.4. She says, my, com my Messiah commands me to dream of peace, she continued. My Messiah commands me to wish for brotherhood between nations. My Messiah is eternal. She goes on, I want to use this opportunity to stand in this Knesset of Israel in 2023 and say with great pride, I, member of the Knesset, Galit Distel Atbarian, believe with complete faith in the coming of Messiah. Even if he delays, I will wait for him every day to arrive and he will come quickly. Amen. At least one of the MKs in attendance echoed her an amen. Wow. Israel is ripe for a spiritual leader and they will split. It will split between Antichrist and Jesus Christ in the seven-year tribulation. But they are ready. Let's go a little further and tell you a little bit more about war. The war against Israel is not a war against Israel. It's another article saying the same thing I said before. It's a war against us. It's a war against the West. By now, most of us have images or video clips of pro Hamas demonstrators disrupting Christian celebrations across the Western world. You have to ask yourself why. Why would Hamas demonstrators bother with Christians? I thought they hated just Jews. In Italy, the traditional Christmas Eve performance at La Scala Opera House in Milan was disrupted by an anti-Israeli protesters. In New York City, demonstrators chanted, Long live the Intifada and Christmas is canceled. They shouted that. And the traditional lighting of the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Plaza was violently interrupted by anti-Israeli rioters as well. Considering that Israel is a Jewish state with only 2% Christian minority, why did Israel's enemies target a holiday celebrating the birth of Jesus? I think someone should be answering those questions. Somebody should be asking those questions. The war against Israel is not a war just against Israel alone. It's a war against the West. It's a jihad, a holy war. Israel is simply receiving the blows right now that are meant for every single one of us. Many in Europe argue in favor of abandoning Israel in order to address the grievances of our Muslim minorities. But if Israel were, God forbid, to go down, it would not bring any solace to the West. It wouldn't mean our Muslim minorities would all of a sudden change their behavior and accept our values. On the contrary, the end of Israel would give enormous encouragement to the forces of Islam. They would see the demise of Israel as proof that the West is weak and doomed. The end of Israel will not mean the end of our problems with Islam, only the beginning. Or consider the words of Steve Venn, and former chief strategist and campaign manager for Donald Trump. He said, this is not about Israel. This is not about the Jewish people. This is a Sharia supremacist global movement powered by the Chinese Communist Party that is funding the mullahs in Tehran in partnership with Moscow and Erdogan of Turkey, who wants to reestablish the Ottoman Empire. People better wake up on this. This is about me. This is about you. This is about your civilization. 
It's about your culture, your society, your country. It's about your beliefs. It's about your family. It's about your children. Throughout the world, populist nationalism is on the rise. While there are many issues that unite this movement across, across different continents, one issue stands above the rest. Western civilization is under attack. More specifically, we recognize that traditional Judeo-Christian culture, and that, make no mistake about it, Muslims know that those two words go together, Judeo-Christian culture, is under attack from the combined forces of neo-Marxist socialism, like the BLM and uh, Black Lives Matter, and mass immigration from parts of the world that don't share Western values. We are letting 10 million illegals across our southern border. By the way, no one talks about the northern border, but they're pouring in from there too. And these illegals are coming from a lot of countries, not just South America and Mexico. They're coming from all over the world. And we have no idea who they are. They do not share our values. So as we see what's happening, this isn't a war against Israel. This is a war against all of us. And I hope it doesn't happen. But sooner or later, we may see some of the cells that may, I believe, already be forming in America start to pop up. Now, Americans, unfortunately, we react to something after it happens. We don't want to hear anything bad. We don't want to hear in the news sometimes because it's so bad. Why? Because we want things pleasant. And I understand that. I understand that. But that's not our world. That's not the world we live in. We can't hide our heads in the sand. The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. One of the reasons why I bring you in the news. People would be amazed if they understood that I don't really listen to the news a whole lot. I don't believe in the and I vet all the news I get. And I go through it and I pour through it every Monday and Tuesday so I can bring it to you on Wednesday and have a prophetic slant to it to let you know what's happening. But I'm not interested in the world news. It's horrible. But I'm not going to hide my head. I know things are happening and I know it's coming to a bottleneck. But remember, Jesus Christ is coming back to claim this planet. Let me go a little bit further and give you a little bit more about in the news. You should see these men's faces. You should know them. Xi Jinping, uh, Vladimir Putin, and... Kim Jong-un. This article says, can the U.S. fight three major wars simultaneously? Before I read it to you, let me tell you the answer. No, absolutely not. Before our leaders drag us into the Middle East, into the middle of World War III, perhaps we should step back and take a hard look at our own capabilities. Military recruiting has been way, way down under Biden. Ammunition levels have fallen to dangerously low levels because of how much we have sent to Ukraine under Biden. And our enemies have developed cutting-edge new weapon systems that we can't match uh, and, it's, and we're not trying to. This is not the 1980s where everyone is still deeply afraid of the United States military. No one is afraid of us right now. In 2021, the U.S. military pulled out of Afghanistan and the Taliban reconquered the entire country even before we were able to get everyone out. In 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine. And despite the fact that we've sent them giant mountains of money, the Ukrainians are losing more territory with each passing day. And the truth is that the United States is already at war in the Middle East. And once Israel decides it's time to push Hezbollah back into the Litani River in southern Lebanon, the U.S. is going to be even more deeply involved. Meanwhile, it appears that the conflict in Ukraine is about to go to another level. The Ukrainians have been shelling civilian targets in the Russian city of Belgorod, and Vladimir Putin is extremely angry about the attacks on Belgorod, and he's vowing to, quote, intensify strikes immensely. Over the past couple of years, the U.S. has provided more funding, far more funding, for the war in Ukraine than anyone else. Far more weapons for the war in Ukraine than anyone else. Far more ammunition in the war in Ukraine than anyone else. And so far, far more intelligence for the war in Ukraine than anyone else. And now Joe Biden is warning that there is a risk that the United States, I'm quoting his words, the United States gets pulled in directly. Whew. Here it is. The stakes of this fight extend far beyond Ukraine, Biden reiterated Friday. They affect the entirety of the NATO alliance, the security of Europe, and the future of the transatlantic relationship, Biden said. When dictators and autocrats are allowed to run roughshod in Europe, he said, the risks the, that, the risk rises that the United States gets pulled directly into the war. What? So could we end up being directly involved in a major war in the Middle East and a major war with Russia at the same time? And meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping just warned that reunification of Taiwan is, quote, historically an inevitability. 
So will Xi Jinping attempt to reunify with Taiwan in 2024? This is his window of opportunity. Everyone is afraid that Trump will get presidency again. Everyone's afraid of his hard tactics, national ta uh, his national and international tactics. They're afraid. Right now, the weakest president ever. Right now is the time to strike. 2024 is a crucial year for the United States. Most Americans have no knowledge of it. They don't realize it. But the moment China makes a move against Taiwan, we will be at war with the Chinese. Why? Because Taiwan is our ally. In a U.S. fight with China, American forces will likely burn through munitions stockpiles within three weeks. Even with a surge of the U.S. industrial base, if we get all the factories running and pushing out our, 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 war, our war machine, replenishing stocks will take more than six months. In the interim, the U.S. will be without sufficient bombs and bullets for its cutting edge systems, such as fifth generation fighter jets, high mobility rocket launch systems. They'll sit empty and anti-air mis anti missiles needed to protect our nuclear aircraft carriers and bases in the Pacific. So right now, the warning indicators are blinking red over and over again. The massive need for ammunition in such conflict, uh, the massive need for ammunition in such conflicts highlights our weakness in the American defense industry, which no longer produces munitions at the rate it did decades ago. Defense budget reductions led to a swift merger of the defense sector, which saw a drop from 51 major defense providers in the early 1990s, you ready? To five today. From 51 major defense providers who are making our defensive weapons to just five today. How in the world, if all that's true, can we possibly fight a war with China? And how in the world can we possibly fight a war with Russia? And let's not forget that Kim Jong-un continues to make threats about going to war with us. North Korean leader, said his military should thoroughly annihilate the United States and South Korea if provoked. State media reported this past Monday after he vowed to boost national defense to cope with what he called an unprecedented U.S.-led confrontation. I hate to say this, but I believe that 2024 will be a year of war around the world. In recent years, our military has been gutted, eviscerated, and transformed into politically correct joke. We couldn't even defeat the Taliban. Now we're facing the possibility of fighting three major wars simultaneously. We are in so much trouble. But most Americans seem to believe that we're still the same global military powerhouse that we were when the first Top Gun movie was originally released. You've got to get our heads off of movies because the movies will glamorize America right now. But America has lost its footing and America is in bad shape. I've preached it for over 30 years. America is nowhere mentioned in end time Bible prophecy, which leads me to believe a couple scenarios, none of which I like. So let's just change just a little bit, because that's pretty dire. Let's go to pure prophecy. 10 reasons why God gave Bible prophecy. Did you know that a whopping 31% of the Bible is God revealing how events will unfold before they happen? Almost a third of our Bible is prophecy. No other book like, is like it, no other religious book anywhere. There's no prophecy at all in the Quran. Not one single verse. Almost a third of our Bible. Our Heavenly Father wants His children to know what the future holds. So here's some reasons why Bible prophecy exists. Number one, it shows that God speaks the truth. Bible prophecy is given to us to show that God is God. He's chief. He's the one in charge. He exists outside of time. He knows everything. And so, whatever God says, you can take it as truth. If He says it prof prophetically in the Bible, I promise you it's going to happen. Secondly, it proves the Bible is God's word. The fact that the Bible is the only book ever written that contains genuine, fulfilled prophecies. These prophecies were fulfilled to the T. Fulfilled Bible prophecy proves that the Bible is truly God's word so you can place our, our trust and our faith in its author. Number three, shows that God is in control. I just read you some of it in the news. It's horrific, but God is in control. He's sovereign. Sovereignty means that God is in control of every single detail that happens in our world. Number four, it demonstrates God's love. Bible prophecy demonstrates His love and His plan for our lives. We're not just floating around on a big spinning orb in outer space for no purpose or no reason, as atheism claims. God has created a purpose for every single person He's ever made because He loves His children. God has also planned a destination and a destiny for the faithful. He gives us prophecy 
to show how the world history will end with the faithful living forever with our loving Heavenly Father in His eternal state. Five, prophecy describes God's plan. He, he provides specific details about His plan for the ages. It shows how God is working to bring humanity back into a right relationship with Him so that one day we will dwell in a blessed time of peace, righteousness, and fellowship with our Creator. Bible prophecy can be very specific and very, very purposeful. Six, it demonstrates God's might. It's, it demonstrates Bible prophecy, God's, the characteristic of God being mighty. The promise is, is there over and over again in Bible prophecy that Jesus will one day return in power and might to victoriously defeat Satan and his minions and set up his kingdom. Seven, it proves God is worthy. It proves how big God is and how teeny, teeny, tiny we are in comparison. No one's like God. But even though God is far greater than we are, he still has use for us, and that's to serve and fellowship with Him. So why should we? Because He alone is worthy of our obedience and our praise. Bible prophecy points us to that. Eight, promises evil will be punished. Evil often gets away with a lot of crimes. Bad people commit bad things, often without ever facing punishment. And yet Bible prophecy promises swift justice is coming. The evil in this world does, does have an end to it. It has a shelf life. While we patiently wait for that glorious day, God is mercifully providing humanity a very short reprieve, number one, to return to Him in repentance, number two, to grab hold of His gracious offer of having a right relationship with Him. Bible prophecy maps out a timeline for that long-desired day of justice. Nine, ninth reason, and it's a beautiful reason, one that I just love, I just love like crazy, concerns how Bible prophecy shows God's grace. Our Creator lets us know what's going to happen ahead of time so we can get right with Him. If God wanted to, he could just drop the hammer on everybody right now because we're sinners and he is not. We deserve to be sentenced to hell for our rebellion against our Creator and for breaking his moral law. But by God's grace, through his love, our Heavenly Father lets us know ahead of time what he's planning to do. We know exactly what judgments are coming as well exactly what blessings are coming. He grants us time to prepare and get right with him. Let me tell you what's going to happen. I have a Revelation series on YouTube right now and on my, on my site, my website. <clears throat> people are familiar with it. Some people are not saved. Once the rapture happens, that thing is going to be the most hit thing you could possibly imagine. Why? Because it details every single thing man will go through. Ten. The tenth and final reason in the list would be that it's meant to give Christians hope. The Lord wants us to understand how the future will play out. Prophecy is meant to give us hope that this evil age will end. Jesus will return as promised to rapture his church before the tribulation begins. I believe he'll defeat evil. And finally he'll institute his thousand year kingdom of peace and righteousness and justice. We gain hope knowing that the Christian's final destination is to dwell in peace with our creator forever in the eternal state. <clears throat> when I may say my prayers at night and there's a long list of prayers people I pray for. One of the things I pray for is for God to send his son. I pray for the soon return of Christ. Why? Because I'm tired of this world. I'm not tired of my family. I'm not tired of the joy that, that, that life gives me. I'm tired of the fact that we're not living where we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live in an eternal peace with none of this news, none of this stuff that's going on. So, Bible prophecy is meant to give us hope to believe that we have a great future ahead of us. But Bible prophecy is also meant to serve as a warning to the unbeliever about the eternal destiny that they're facing in the lake of fire. And so the Bible calls us to repent to accept Christ and his loving sacrifice so you may be reconciled with God and share in that eternal hope. All right, let me give you a couple more things. Global economy. Economic turbulence coming in 2024. 38% of companies anticipate layoffs. I'm not going to go through this one, but I'm going to tell you this. 38 companies say they're likely to lay off a lot of people in 2024. 52% are likely to implement a hiring freeze in 2024. Half, 50%. Say anticipation of a recession is a reason for potential layoffs. And 4 in 10, 40%, say layoffs are due to replacing workers with artificial intelligence, AI. So if you currently have a job of high value, try to hold on to it as tightly as you can because the employment market is starting to shift in a big way. Hasbro will cut 20% of its workforce in 2024. Roku is going to be limiting new hires, laying off 10%. We know that... <clears throat> City CEO Jane uh, Frazier announced layoffs in September and she's going to have at least 10% more workforce 
across several business lines in 2024. Flexport Logistics is going to cut 30% of its employees. Financial companies, Charles Schwab, is cutting back 16% of its workforce. Unfortunately, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Many more layoffs are coming. Meanwhile, retailers continue to close stores at an astounding play, pace. Bidenomics is not working. More than 3,000 retail locations were shut down in 2023, but that's nothing compared to what's coming. According to UBS anal analyst Michael Lasser, the U.S. remains over-retailed. Lasser estimates that the U.S. will shed almost, you ready for this, 50,000 brick and mortar stores by 2028. 50,000. Is anyone listening? Is anyone paying attention? Can you imagine what our communities would look like if that projection is even close to accurate? As economic conditions deteriorate, people are going to get more desperate and the conditions in our streets will be even more chaotic. Are you just fear-mongering, Pastor Mark? Well, I wish I was, but you may not have heard about this yet, but earlier this week, a giant mob of more than 100 young people savagely looted a bakery in Compton, California. The thieves gathered in the area for an illegal street takeover around 3 a.m. Tuesday before making the mile-long trek to Ruben's Bakery and Mexican Food. When they got to the locked store, a white Kia backed into the front doors, clearing an entryway for the crowd of pillagers to get their loot. We aren't talking about a handful of lawless citizens here. Literally dozens upon dozens of lawless young people looted this store mall, this small store, and they didn't hesitate to take whatever they wanted. Most Americans are probably not even aware that it happened. That's because this story barely made a blip in the news cycle. And the reason why it barely made a blip in the news cycle is because this sort of thing has been happening quite commonly in our country. The thin veneer of civilization that we all take for granted on a daily basis is rapidly disappearing. And now we're headed towards the most hotly contested presidential election in history. And that will bring societal tensions to a boiling point. I've been asked, and uh, we're still making a contact with someone to go on a, uh, on a talk, to have a, um, a video talk about uh, this upcoming presidential election, what it means to us. Listen, it's very, very crucial. And people don't want my, my take. A lot of people don't. They don't want to hear about reports like this. We are all spoiled. We want our fast food quick, we want our feel-good church ser services, and we want to hear only good news. We have been lulled to sleep. Lethargy is all over us. It, you know, you hear it. Ask somebody how they're doing. Oh, it's all good. No, our world is not all good. It's evil, and it's getting worse. Hiding our heads in the sand, as I said before, listening to 10-minute soft sermons on YouTube just won't cut it anymore. <clears throat> because things like this are happening. Christians forced out of dance competition for biblical views on gender. Apparently, certain countries promote the freedom of religion as long as it doesn't involve Christian beliefs. The National Independence Festival of Creative Arts recently banned the Christian dance group Praise Academy of Dance Barbados for competing for com uh, from competition for holding a biblical view of gender. Their performance, which they titled Speak Life, featured a girl who struggled with her gender identity. Throughout the, the piece, the dancers emphasized there's only two genders, Featuring verses like Genesis 127, So God created man in his own image, the image of God. He created man, male and female. He created them, the truth proclaimed. It's not a choice. You don't get to pick. That's the science period, they said. For 20 years, the dance group has only performed as Christians without punishment around the world. That changed, all changed last month, when the festival organizers decided to disqualify the team from anything they could possibly do. Here in the U.S., Mid-Vermont Christian School understood understands frustration all too well. When the girls' basketball team uh, were going to play an opponent that had a transgender identifying athlete, the Vermont Principals Association, which represents 300 schools throughout the state of Vermont, blacklisted the school from all state-sponsored events in the state in the future, according to, including VPA Spring Sports, for which schools are still creating schedules. Listen, we, this is the first the first instance of Barbados banning Christians, but it's not the first instance in America. The culture doesn't have a problem with Christians because of who we worship. It's because who we refuse to worship. The most offensive thing about Christianity is the idea that there's no king except Jesus Christ. Shadrach, Misha, and Abednego were told that they had to worship Nebuchadnezzar or face the consequences. The first century church was told they had to worship Caesar or also face the consequences. Christians are told to worship the rainbow gods today of self-determination or face the consequences. We should respond fearlessly. God is very capable 
of protecting us from whatever threatens us. And he is very capable of taking what they intend for harm and using it for our good. All right, this one's going to hit a lot of you because I just did a whole lot of research on this one. And I know Irina knows it's going a little bit long tonight, but there's for a reason. 14 things to know about the great American eclipse of 2014. It's coming. 14 things to know. Number, we are just a bit more than three months away from what many believe will be the most dramatic total solar, solar eclipse in the United States history. It's being called the Great American Eclipse of 2024. And millions of America will take time, Americans will take time off in order to travel so they can personally see it. This is part of what I spoke about in that 2017 documentary I did in Hollywood called The Sign. Between now and April, the mainstream news will be filled with stories about this eclipse. And so it's going to be difficult for anyone to ignore what's going on. But I wanted you to get a heads up. 14 things that everyone needs to know about this great American eclipse. Number one, it's a total solar eclipse and it will occur, occur on April 8th, 2024. Two, the path of the eclipse will travel through portions of the states of Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Three, the path of the eclipse will also travel through parts of Mexico and Canada. Four, this will be the most viewed astronomical event in the entire history of our country. Five, more than 30 million Americans will simply be able to step out of their homes and see this eclipse with no, no telescope, no binoculars, nothing. Six, we're being told this eclipse may be the single biggest mass travel event of 2024. Several large cities very close to the path of totality are St. Louis, Cincinnati, Detroit, Toronto, Quebec, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. are also within 200 miles of the direct path. Seven, those that are in the direct path of the eclipse will discover that the air temperature will suddenly become approximately 10 degrees cooler once the moon is fully blocked by the sun. Eight, the path of the great American eclipse of 2024 will cross the United States on the very first day of the year of the Hebrew calendar. Now listen, because these signs are for reasons. The secular world may not know it. I'm going to show it to you tonight. Nine, if you put the path of the Great American Eclipse of 2024, the path of the Ring of Fire solar eclipse of October, 20, October 14th, 2023, and the path of the Great American Eclipse that I spoke about in 2017, all on a map, they, could form, they combine to form a giant Paleo-Hebrew Aleph over America. That's an Aleph. We get our word, our, our alphabet from the A. In the first, it's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. Ten, if you just path, put the path of the Great American Eclipse of 2024 and the path of the Great American Eclipse of 2017 on a map, they can form to form a Paleo-Hebrew Tav. Just the two of them. That's a Tav. This is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. This is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It looks like an A and a T or a cross. Now, 11, the heart of the Paleo Hebrew Tav forms a giant X that falls directly over the New Madrid fault line. 12, the path of the solar eclipse that occurred on June 16, 1806, combined with the path of a solar eclipse that occurred on September 17, 1811, also formed a giant X over the New Madrid fault zone. 13, three months after that solar eclipse that happened in 1811, a series of absolute enormous earthquakes began to happen on the New Madrid fault line. And the New Madrid earthquakes are the largest earthquakes in American history. They occurred in the central Mississippi Valley, but were felt as far away as New York City, Boston, and Montreal, and Washington, D.C. President James Madison and his wife Dolly felt them in the White House. Church bells rang in Boston from the, from the, from the earthquakes. Uh, from December 16th, 1811, through May of 1812, there were over uh, 6,000 to 10,000 earthquakes in the boot heel of Missouri, where the New Madrid is located near the junction of the Ohio and Mississippi, Mississippi rivers. In the known history of the world, no other earthquakes have lasted so long or produced so much evidence of damage as the New Madrid earthquakes. Three of the earthquakes are on the list of Americans' top earthquakes. The first, December 16, 1811, eight, a magnitude of 8.1, massive, on the Richter scale. January 23, 1812, 7.8. Third of February, uh, 1812, 8.8 .8 magnitude. Number 14, the next total solar eclipse will be visible for the United States will not happen until 2044. And the path of that solar eclipse will only touch three states. So what does this mean, Pastor Mark? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look, I believe this is also a major spiritual sign that will, that will um, 
that the White House could be shaken. America needs to be shaken. April 8th will be the first day of the year of the Hebrew calendar. It makes a giant Aleph, first letter of the Hebrew calendar, follows the, the last letter, the Tav, of the 2017th quake. An Aleph in Hebrew is silent. And the Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There's the Aleph, first letter. There's the Tav. Now we know it as an A and as a T, but that's the Hebrew. That's the first and last. And you've heard this, haven't you? I am the Alpha and the Omega. Revelation 1, 8. That's Greek. Let me tell it to you in Hebrew. I am the Aleph and the Tav. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. Is God trying to tell us something? Well, guess what that verse in Hebrew means? That is the Aleph and the Tav. The beginning and the end. Is Jesus... Is Jesus asserting his rulership over America? Is he warning us that there's a beginning and there's an end? Maybe. And one last thing tonight. I know our in the news went pretty long. This is one for weird things. This is a picture of 200 police cars coming to one spot, the Miami Mall. What is a massive alien spotted outside the Miami, Miami Mall? The year 2024 started with Florida uh, in Florida with a bizarre rumor spreading like wildfire on social media. A 10-foot tall alien was roaming in a Miami shopping mall, inviting a huge police presence in the vicinity. Speculative speculation market turned red hot after a video went viral on social media showing a massive, a massive figure strolling outside Bayside Marketplace. The video showed an alien shadow surrounded by dozens of police officers and cruisers with their lights on. Rumors on the internet. As soon as the video went viral, the spectators and murmurs came flooding in. I don't know if the rumors about the aliens in the Miami Mall are real, one said, but I do know I've never seen any, this many police in one place, an ex-user said. Um, Miami Mall was shut down by police, and rumors have uh, spread around about this 10-foot-tall um, alien. Some are saying it was frightening. Over 200 cars. Still, that's an awful lot of police cars. Response to a single incident, nearly one, nearly 200. Very strange. What's not strange is the final, but, what, but well, what's not strange is that the police immediately came out and said that it was just a couple kids fighting in the mall. Well, actually, they said there were 50 kids fighting in the mall. So, I don't believe in aliens. I think if there's something that was seen there, you may think it was a demon because they do manifest themselves. So, I can't say that's for sure, uh, but it's quite, quite interesting that and strange that 200 police cars would come. What's not